Sodom and Gideon. Then we looked at Noah. And we, he went through the, the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to the human race. He went through the flood. And we saw that the first thing he did after surviving that, he built an altar to remember God's faithfulness in saving him and bringing him through. And last time I spoke, we were doing a dedication, but we were looking at Abraham and how we built an altar, and he named it The Lord Will Provide. And he built this altar at a time of great testing that he was going through. And so this morning I want us to carry on looking at Abraham, and I'm going to read three pieces of scripture from his early life, and we're going to try and tie these together. So the first reading is Genesis 12, verse 1 to 7, and it's quite a famous piece of scripture. But he says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And it says, so Abraham, Abraham, he departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother, brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people who they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. And it says, so they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And it says, And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So Abram, he built an altar at the place where God appeared. Okay, the second reading is Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. And he said, Arise and walk in the land through its length and breadth, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent, and he went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which were in Hebron. And he built an altar to the Lord there. And the third reading is Genesis 15, starting at verse 5. Then he, that's God, he brought him outside and he says, Look now towards the heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So your descendants shall be. And he believed the Lord and he accounted it to him as righteousness. And then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So God said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these things to him and he cut them in two down the middle and he placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And then it says, and then the vultures came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. So I want us to see today that there are two big similarities that are common in all these accounts. These three altars that were constructed came because Abraham had received a promise. We could say these altar encounters were not places of request, but they were places of revelation and promise. It was a place where 
Abraham heard from the Lord. And he marked these moments because they were very special. And he marked them by building an altar. You know, Abraham, he received a word for himself and a word for his wife. He wasn't asking for anything. He was receiving. And I think that's something, again, we need to look at again. Because so many, when we come to God in prayer, we come with our requests. And the Bible does tell us to do this, to bring our prayers and requests to God. But like I've said in other weeks, sometimes we just turn up with a a shopping list of wants and needs. But we make no time to be still and receive revelation from God or guidance. We just come because we want issues fixing. Sometimes we do ask for things and then we move on so quickly that we miss the answer. We don't hang around long enough just to be still and to listen and to find out what it is that God wants to say and what it is that he wants to show us. But Abraham, he let God talk. He made time. He made room. He received a word. And we could say he received a promise. And today we're, we're in a world that's surrounded with noise. And so many of us would rather talk than listen. You know, the next time you're having a conversation with someone... Just have this little test. Just try and be silent and just listen. And it's so hard because sometimes we just want to jump in and and say what we think. And it's really hard for us just to be still and to listen to what someone else is saying. And that can transfer to our relationship with God. Too many of us were too busy talking to make time to listen. And I was saying to Florina this week, it would be interesting if we had a scale and we were to record the times that we spoke to God and we were talking and how many times we were just still and were listening. Because I believe our, our scale would definitely be one-sided. It would be overbalanced. I think it's because silence sometimes makes us uncomfortable. I know if I was just to stand here for five minutes and not say anything, I'd be uncomfortable and I'm sure you would be. But... I believe that when we're still, it makes us sensitive to hear the voice of God. And I think that's why we have an enemy who loves to surround us with noise and busyness. I mean, if you, were, if you go out walking anywhere these days, how many people have got headphones in, constantly having their minds bombarded with noise, and they're not still to be able to listen? For Abraham, these altars that he built were places of promise. And my question for us this morning is, what is it that God has spoken to us about? What is it that he has promised us? What are the things that he has said about us and about our children and our families? What is it that God said about our church and our future? What has he said about what we're currently going through? You know, Abraham, he lived on promises, even when he didn't see the fulfillment of them for many, many years. And some of the promises that were made to him weren't fulfilled till generations later after his death, and some are still being fulfilled to this day. I believe some of us struggle because we haven't got a promise to hold on to. Or we aren't aware of the promises that God has given us in his word. So when the storm comes and we get battered by it, because we've not got a promise to hold on to, we haven't got anything to, that anchors us and, and causes us to be secure. You know, when our feelings and our circumstances would lead us in the opposite direction of what God is saying and doing and away from his best, when we feel alone, when we feel that actually nobody cares, 
when God seems an absolute million miles away. We need a promise that we can stand on and count on. Because what God says is the actual truth of any situation and circumstance. The Bible tells us that God is not a man that he should lie. If he said something, he is faithful and able to perform it. Now, his promises, they might come to us with conditions, things that we need to do. But that's what being in a relationship is all about. Sometimes God makes a promise, but we have to choose to go with what God's plan is. If we want his best, we have to receive his best and walk in that way. God's thoughts are so much higher than ours. His his ways are so much better than ours. So today I just want to encourage you, let's make time for God to speak so we can actually see and hear what his thoughts towards us are. I believe that God has got a promise for each one of us. He has truth that he wants to reveal to us. So let's let him speak and let's be ready to listen and receive. You know, sometimes we're so desperate for a a touch from God. We're we're so desperate for a feeling. We want that feel-good feeling that sometimes we get when we're in God's presence. But you know, sometimes long after a feeling wears off, It's the promise that will sustain us. The second thing I want us to see from these three accounts is that a long time passed from the time the promise was given to the time of the promise's fulfilment. And Abraham, he needed to be reminded, it seemed, through those years. Now, sometimes life gets busy and... Problems come, and these things cause us to forget what God said. And sometimes that causes God's words of promise to be pushed to one side. But then when that happens, we've got to be still. We've got to take time to pause and remember what God has already done and what he said he would do. And we need to make time to recall those words. Bring to our minds his promises from the past. Some of us are struggling because it's been a long time that's gone by from the time that we received the promise. And sometimes we just sometimes almost give up on what God has said because it's taken so long. In the third passage of scripture, we see that Abraham, he had to defend his altar of promise from the vultures. It's great to have a promise, but we have an enemy who wants to rob us and steal that promise from us. And to defeat him, we've got to fight. We've got to drive him away. And we're going to have to, to drive off the vultures of doubt, fear, and discouragement. We're going to have to fight to get hold and keep hold of what God has said. The enemy will try to steal what God's promised. So we need to go back to God's altar of promise and we need to fight for what is ours. Now looking around today, I know some of you are very, very good at fighting. You know, we fight for our rights, we fight for our way, we fight for our plans. But today I believe it's a day to fight for what God has said over us. It's time to fight for what God has said about us. It's time to fight for what God has promised over our families. And we need to speak to those vultures that are circling, and we need to tell them to to back off in the name and power of Jesus. I believe we need to speak to trials and tribulations 
and let them know that they cannot steal our promise. They cannot stop what God has said from happening in our lives. This morning we're going to close with a song and I want this to be our declaration. And these are the words. Speaking about God, it says, You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us, Jesus. Our hope is in you alone. Our strength is in your mighty name. And our peace in the darkest day remains you, Jesus. And then it ends with this. This we know we will see the enemy run. This we know we will see the victory come. And we hold on to every promise you've ever made because, Jesus, you're unfailing. You're our God through the wilderness. You're our joy through the heaviness. And you're our way when there seems to be no way. And we're going to sing this and then we're going to pray.
over, there is no 